to the DCCAP eSummit uh, Spring Edition, I guess. So hopefully everyone's doing okay. My name is Tim Deep. I'm the Customer Success Manager at DCCAP. I'll be hosting today. So next, I'd like to bring up Gary Smith. He's the Strategic Partner Development Manager at Nexus. Uh, Gary is a... Uh, so Nexus, uh, they, they provide hosting for Magento, WordPress, and WooCommerce sites. Uh, Gary, he's got experience in industrial sales and e-commerce as a merchant, agency leader, and hosting provider. So he has a, like a 360 view of the whole digital transformation in uh, e-commerce. And his topic today is how direct to consumer can increase opportunities for uh, OE OEMs. So Gary, I'd like to bring you up on stage. All right, Tim, I appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Looks good. Thank you so much. Okay, Gary. great. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm reminded of those college team presentations where you all did your own research and independently put some of the same points on some of the same slides, because I'm afraid you're probably going to see be seeing some things again, because we've just all come to the same uh, conclusions and have all observed some of the same things naturally about the landscape we're in. Uh, so I think, I think some commonalities to a lot of these presentations um, have been and will be um, how the world's changing naturally, how e-commerce is growing exponentially. And, um, you know, we're all, we're all sort of acknowledging the, uh, the Amazon factor today. Uh, I won't be any exception, but I'll, I'll try not to be too redundant with these observations. I'm Gary Smith. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm a channel partner rep with Nexus. Uh, we work with DC Cap extensively and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, we do uh, managed application hosting. We're, we're owned by Liquid Web and we're, we're the part of the company that provides hosting that is specifically tailored for WordPress, WooCommerce, and the area where we work with DC Cap the most is Magento. So we provide uh, advanced technical support for those and a few other applications like Oro Commerce and um, Drupal and things like that. So as mentioned, or as promised, we'll, we'll get into some observations about how the landscape's changing. I do want to offer this that may be a little different than what you've heard today. Uh, one of the things that COVID, the year of COVID, as I think we'll mainly know 2020 and part of 21 for, has um, exposed us all to that maybe we've all gotten a little bit um, complacent about is supply chain scarcity. As we talk today, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, you may be more or less affected by this, but there are gas shortages in some places because of a pipeline that's been um, just electronically hacked with some with ransomware, I believe. Um, and of course, all of us in the South, we're used to those panic buying situations. Some of us are getting our five gallon gas cans and lining them up and going to the gas station. So scarcity or perceived scarcity sometimes really breeds um, or exposes some of the complexity and, and fragility of the supply chain. The thing I've got up on the, on the screen right now is a webcam that I checked recently and they're back to normal. You can buy these any day of the week now. But last year when I had two college students and my wife, um, needing webcams for class, for work, uh, church-related stuff where they hadn't necessarily needed one before, or perhaps they came home for, from campus and they had one in their apartment where they lived in, in that town but forgot to bring it with them. And so all of a sudden, everybody needs a webcam. And we weren't the only ones who needed a webcam as evidenced by the fact that this webcam I'm showing you on screen, which normally you can buy from, I don't know, $65 to $80. The day I looked at this, this screenshot is from 2020 and the price was $89 or $90 and you couldn't get one. Uh, they were on back order. I saw some on eBay for over $200. So this is kind of a consumer item. What does that have to do with B2B e-commerce and why you should be in it? 
let me move on to the next point. I think most, if not all of these stats may have been seen by you already today, if you've attended all the presentations, but it is, it is just almost impossible for us to get our heads around what has gone on with e-commerce uh, in the past year. And I think one of the reasons it's hard to get our heads around is because it was already growing in a hockey stick curve. And, and if it's possible to go from a hockey stick curve to even more vertical, COVID-19 did it for us. The anecdote that I often use is my 80 plus year old mother-in-law is buying groceries online now. Instead of going through all the aisles at the supermarket and writing a check at the end of that process, um, my wife's having to help her with it, but nevertheless, her money is going into an e-commerce platform for, um, for that purchase. Um, you know, next stat, buying online was often a consumer's only option in 2020. And the thing that I think is intuitive, probably to everybody listening here today, but may surprise some people out there is they're not going back. They're finding that it, it's more convenient to buy online. And again, that's not just consumer goods. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll get more into that as we go. But 900 billion with a B more purchased online in 2020 on top of the trends that have been going on for a decade. You may or may not realize this, and I think it's part of what's leading to some of these supply scarcities. Customer optimism is rapidly rebounding. Um, over 50% of customers surveyed by McKinsey around March of 2021 say they will spend extra to treat themselves. Only 15% are pessimistic. Some people have been displaced. Some people are having a hard time. But many, many consumers, their jobs have continued. As we've gotten through this and through the worst of it, they're more confident that they'll continue to have that job. And so spending is really pretty strong. And that's going to drive not only consumer goods, but of course, as the wheels turn, that'll also drive B2B transactions as well. Another supply chain scarcity issue that I noticed in a, listening to a podcast the other day, and here's a stat for it. Demand for automotive electronics is growing 28 to 36%. Um, there are car manufacturers today that are shipping cars. Um, I'm not precisely sure what they're doing for a workaround, maybe putting one of those old double din cassette players in the dashboard in, in lieu of the navigation system or whatever that they can't ship because chips and boards and things are so hard to get right now for certain things, but we're in a, we're in a seller's market. And so it's really a great time to consider modernizing your processes. Here's the opportunity. We're going to talk a little bit about the opportunity and we're going to talk about some of the problems. In other words, the, the risk side of this, um, we, um, our last speaker talked about how the workforce is, is aging and how the boomers are exiting the, um, the management sphere. Well, and I'm, I'm intentionally using this term digital natives and not millennials. Uh, when we think generationally, we often, I think somewhat pejoratively, apply these generational labels and as a guy in my mid fifties, I'll admit that there's a tendency to have a mental picture of a millennial as being like my kids. And guess what? First of all, my kids are growing up. And secondly, millennials are not like the age of my kids. Millennials are in their forties. Um, and people in their forties grew up not knowing anything really different other than they had a computer and they had internet access um, what's a fax machine picking up the phone and ordering something, uh, by that channel just seems a little bit nuts to them. So they're looking for online search, self-serve purchase. That was also alluded to in an earlier presentation. Uh, Brandon made excellent points about that. It's really, really true. People are less interested in picking up the phone, ending up in an exchange with a sales rep, unless they really need help with that purchase. Online commerce allows you to scale into new global markets, um, allows you to do things like language uh, localization and currency localization 
Uh, see, I'm hitting all the other presenters today. Uh, you can more easily sell and ship to other markets using the tools that are now afforded to you. Your competitors are already there. Uh, we'll talk about competitors, both non-Amazon and Amazon. But the thing that you may not have considered if you are sitting on the sidelines and thinking online sales is not that important to us. We sell, we sell widgets. People buy these things in bulk. People, uh, this is a, this is a detailed involved purchase. And so we feel like it's going to be complicated. I want you to understand the risk you're taking here because simply outsourcing that function to Amazon has its risks and just simply leaving it to chance also has risks. Amazon is an entity, obviously, that, as evidenced by the fact that we're all talking about them, extremely powerful in e-commerce. Um, to channel one of Don Draper's lines, that's not good or bad, it just is. They have tremendous buying power, tremendous ability to vertically integrate on things. And this is nothing new. It goes all the way back to the early grocery stores. Whenever they see an opportunity, they're going to build their own products. One difference is they have much more data than retailers of prior generations ever dreamed of having to know exactly what's selling. And if you completely rely on Amazon as your online channel, you can be the one giving them that data. What kind of vitamins sell the best? What kind of batteries sell the best? Where? What length of cables? What, what color cords? Um, all these things are just, is just data that frankly, we're all handing to Amazon. And so you just need to be aware of that risk, especially if you sell, um, highly specialized industrial, uh, equipment or supplies. I added this screenshot just yesterday as I, as I was thinking about this, you may look at these products and go, what are, what am I looking at? These are products in my first career that I sold in my parents' um, little mom and pop supply company. They're on Amazon now. So if we think of Amazon as primarily about consumer goods, then we don't understand the extent to which Amazon is really able to be a channel to sell anything and everything. That's something that you need to understand if you're not really doing e-commerce yet. And also something that, as we'll get to a little bit later, is a factor in how am I going to handle this if I have a dealer network? Just another slide here showing how if we don't control the online availability and reputation of our components and assemblies, somebody else will. Somebody out there is going to do arbitrage and sell our stuff online. So it can be, we can control that and provide that user experience, or people can go to some kind of aggregation site like the one I'm showing and just make those things available online. So returning to benefits, if we embrace this change and perhaps take advantage of strong sales and a strong demand cycle right now to drive this process and build the B2B direct to consumer site you need, we can enjoy profitability. We can, we can by selling directly where it's appropriate, um, simply be more profitable. Perhaps more importantly, we can build the customer relationship. Um, again, this kind of tags on to, from a previous presentation. When we understand and can get data directly from our customers, our users of this product, the people are trying to make the holes with the drills, then we can understand better what they need, when they want to buy it, how they want to buy it, when and where they need to repair it, what parts they need, all that sort of thing. I've already talked about data. The amount of data that you can get from a properly built online system is incredible. Uh, it's better than operating a retail store. It's uh, better than relying solely on dealers and distributors. And it allows you to understand your consumer better, uh, personalize the marketing effort, uh, help them understand what they need, what they need next, and drive upsells, retention, and commitment. 
So, and this is my last slide. And I want to talk about how this can, how this can be done badly. And if you are a manufacturer who traditionally has worked through dealers, I want to encourage you to, even as you're building an online site, don't view it as, well, we're just going to bypass the dealers. We're going to skip the middleman and just sell direct without consideration for those channels we've built, those relationships we've built. Um, I've personally experienced that. And that uh, example from earlier of industrial products, um, that manufacturer, and this goes back a couple of decades now, you know, that manufacturer just basically signaled to us, well, we don't need you anymore. And it, that was very early days of e-commerce. And it really wasn't based on that idea. It was just the idea of, well, we're simply going to take things more direct. Uh, we're going to rely on bigger dealers. We're going to rely less on the mom and pops. Um, that was a long time ago. I don't know what choices they really had in those days, but the choice you have, if you are a maker of something that you can, um, is that you can build a site, you can build an, a sales delivery system that where appropriate really brings your dealers in. You can, you can be the one to educate and inform dealers about how they, just like you, can be suffering or losing sales from the gray market sites, like I talked about earlier, losing sales from people who simply buy stuff and put it back on Amazon. Um, and you can provide tools. You can, uh, for example, provide uh, catalog tools for your reps. There is still a role very much for sales reps in today's world. They answer questions. We answer questions for consumers that they don't or they can't or don't want to figure out for themselves. So equip your reps with a site that provides a better catalog. Guess what? Your sales reps hate thumbing through your paper catalog too. Um, you can provide location finders for your dealers. You can provide localized sites for your dealers who, who support you and provide your equipment and provide repairs for your equipment and so forth. Um, one of the problems that was really hard to solve in e-commerce even like five years ago that's gotten so much easier is things like parts locators, parts finders. Um, optimize your search on your site, not like it's a, just a consumer site in different, in different guise, but rather a site where people go looking for parts for things they may have bought from your dealers. There's a lot of ways to work this where you can make your dealers, your distributors, your partners, um, still your partners when you go online and even when you sell through some channels direct to consumer. So um, that's really all I've got. Thanks for listening. Um, and I appreciate it, Tim. Back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for uh, just the partnerships and your presentation. We always value uh, you and Nexus. So thank you so much. That's it. That's all we have for now. And hopefully uh, you guys will stay tuned for our next e-summit in November. We do have e-sessions on a monthly basis on uh, specific case study examples. And I think for the one for, Ju for June, we'll be more on the uh, Jansen industry. So the janit uh, janitor and sanitation industry. But that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for, for all your time. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys again. Stay safe out there. Bye, guys.